the leader of this 170th SOLC committee meeting, Thiru Sushil Chandra Mohanta, general manager of IOB, Thiru P.P. Sengupta, the ND and CEO of Indian Overseas Bank, Thiru SMN Swami, regional director of the RBI, Thiru Vekra Krishna, chief general manager of Nabar office, Shri VVS Karayat, the Deputy Secretary, Department of National, Financial Services of the Finance Ministry of India. Uh, my colleague, Tiruan Murugan Additional Chief Secretary, Finance. The many senior secretaries and officers of the government who are here. The team from Nagar and uh, my fellow friends and bankers. Thank you all for coming and uh, for taking the time and uh, joining us to discuss some very important things today. As uh, the CEO of IAB mentioned, we have just crossed one year in office. In some ways it has been a big learning uh, experience for us. Many of us are new to our jobs. Uh, certainly I am new. Uh, very new even to the system of politics, relatively speaking. And we were definitely test, tested, uh, trial by fire, if you will. Within a uh, few days of coming to office, the peak of the second wave was upon us of COVID. We struggled to uh, get enough oxygen, find enough uh, beds. Just when we were coming out of that, we had a do the amended budget first time. There was so much uncertainty that we had to take a lot of guesses in putting in that budget. Just when the budget finished and we were getting ready for action, we had the historic rains. You know, if anybody argues there is no climate change, I just want to point out that we had 100 year rains twice in five years. So clearly uh, this is a consequence of some serious environmental changes. As we were recovering from that, we had the third wave upon us. And in a way that we had to adjust the schedule of the SLBC meetings. And then of course we had to go for the full budget uh, for the second year and all the demands for grants that arose from that. At some level, it feels like we've been on a continuous kind of uh, you know, high-intensity workout. But I guess at the end, the results are the important thing. Everybody can talk about the process, the intent, the philosophy. The results tell us what the real uh, kind of impact and value is. In that sense, I'm very happy, uh, as I'm sure you've all seen, that even in the revised estimates we presented, in uh, February, March, that uh, the state, I should say, mid-March, that the state's fiscal performance has improved significantly and for the first time in seven years, uh, we brought the revenue deficit down, we brought the fiscal deficit down and uh, in by noticeable amounts in a context at a time when most states and certainly the union government's numbers uh, turned out to be double hours, so we came in closer to 3.5 and they were closer to 7. Now I want to make the point in uh, this meeting, as much as in the public, that the union government has a great luxury that it only answers to itself. And nobody else puts any limits on its borrowings or its fiscal discipline. I mean the market is eventually there as other rating agencies. But on a day-to-day -day basis, the union government answers to nobody but itself. Whereas the union government actively enforces through the 293.3 provisions, actively enforces borrowing limits on the states and increasingly is aggressive about how those borrowing limits are set, which I pointed out in other forums, actually are quite arbitrary. Uh, what the central government's own CSO tells us at GSDP is, we are not allowed to borrow the limit that the central government says is the borrowing limit or the union government says is the borrowing limit of 
that GHDP. Instead, they give better haircut, saying there's some kind of netting and all that going on, as the first step. And then it gets aggressive and aggressive after that. So we are in this very difficult situation where, on the one hand, the union very, very actively interferes in our daily functioning and tells us what we can and cannot do, far beyond at least the mainstream component of the Constitution, other than this one clause. We have our own FRA Act, which the Assembly is free to amend. And yet, the Union puts conditions on us beyond our own Act. On the other hand, they tell us when we should cut and how much we should cut taxes and all that. This is not a logical or a considerate action, in my opinion. When I say this independent of politics, I'm just talking math now and numbers. But when the final account comes, you'll find that we've improved even further than uh, we presented in the revised estimate, significantly better. And at some level, that is our job. To the extent that we have a partnership between the banking industry, starting with the Reserve Bank that does monetary policy, including all the banks that facilitate credit, uh, that keep the market afloat. And in an emerging economy with a less than fully developed debt and credit market, then the value of these banks is even much higher. I've mentioned in previous SLBC meetings that the value of banking sector in India is much, much higher than, let's say, an advanced economy because the market, the debt market, and the unsecured credit to retail market is practically non-existent. So it is only the banks that can provide this kind of support. And in most cases, at least in my banking career, we assume that in a developing economy, if the GSDP or GDP was growing at X, that credit should grow roughly 2X to support that, because there's a lot of leverage in the system and there's not enough capital. Anyway, uh, with that as our performance for the year, let me turn a little bit to the SLBC uh, as uh, predecessors or uh, earlier speakers before pointed out. Um, you know, this government under the leadership of the Chief Minister has taken very much uh, cognizance and has given great emphasis to the value of the SLBC and its role in the economy and in our functioning. Chief Minister himself has addressed one of these meetings and I don't think I've missed a single meeting except inadvertently when I did not know what was happening. And so now I've laid down instructions that uh, I should be aware and given the opportunity to attend all meetings. That's how importantly we take this. Uh, the convener gave us some overview of what had happened in the previous meeting. Uh, the IAB and D spoke very insightfully both of the statistics of our state and of uh, the activities that all of you together conduct in our state. But I was also very impressed with this very insightful and, and in my opinion, accurate prediction of where the world economy is and where interest rates are and where they're likely to go. Though I agree with uh, Mr. Swami that trying to predict Reserve Bank action is a mug's game. I think in this case we can all agree that it's only going in one direction. In fact, uh, if I make a slight um, kind of tangential uh, series of remarks from there, I've also just returned after my first kind of extended overseas trip since uh, the pandemic. And in the course of over about three weeks on two separate trips, I was in New York uh, in the US and places in Canada, in uh, the UK, in Australia and Singapore. And it's very clear this is a global phenomenon. After years of wondering how trillions of dollars of liquidity could not, uh, would not, and did not uh, drive inflation. I think that uh, dilemma no longer exists. We are in the serious throes of an inflationary cycle that is true all over the world. It is driven partially, as uh, the MBN CEO mentioned, by supply shocks and by unfortunate and extraneous events like the Ukraine war. But it is also driven, I think, by structural changes in the labor market that most of us did not realize had happened. So at least in the U.S., in most advanced economies actually, in the U.S., in the U.K. to some extent because that's also confounded by Brexit. But in the U.S., in Australia, uh, in Singapore, 
we have a serious problem where the snapback in demand has left the labor market very, very tight. Many people have exited the labor market, I'm saying like pilots of planes onwards, highly skilled people have exited the market and have not come back uh, with the full intention of, uh, you know, full-time employment. And then, of course, two years of hiatus puts all kinds of additional training requirements on bringing them back to work. So hundreds of flights have been cancelled all over the world. Hundreds of, uh, therefore, uh, meetings, activities, business uh, processes are being disrupted. And that's just one part of the, very important, but one part of the economy. So my own view, and I had, among other meetings, I had dinner with the uh, uh, MIT uh, fellow alumnus of mine, uh, Deputy Governor of the Reserve Bank of Australia. And I think it's very clear that there also the day I met him, they had just done a rate hike for the second time this year, this calendar year, and that many more are likely to come. So I think we should expect we're going into a kind of uh, inflation fighting cycle after probably 15 years or, or 13 years, 14 years since the 2008 global financial crisis for the first time. And now we have a problem. It's not just the ex excess liquidity that most of the banks in the world have pumped out. And just so we're not forgetting, there's at least four or five trillion or maybe more of excess liquidity from the OECD banks sloshing around in the system compared to the balance sheets of 2008. Even if you allow for the growth of the economy and of the devaluation of money through inflation, we're still looking at several trillion dollars of extra liquidity in the markets compared to what the trajectory would have been had there not been a global financial crisis, had there not been a COVID. And the double part of the whammy is that most governments have done massive fiscal stimulus as a way of uh, offsetting or combating the effects of the pandemic. So I'm trying to think back and I find it hard to think of any other circumstance where we had these two factors together, maybe more than 100 years ago. I certainly wasn't studying markets back in the 1920s or 30s. But in my lifetime, I'm struggling to find another point in the economic kind of cycle of any country, let alone the globe, where you had this much excess liquidity, at the same time you had this much fiscal stimulus, and now we're paying the consequences of that. I'm not even saying it is the wrong thing to do, maybe it is the right thing to do, but now the chickens are coming home to roost. Why I say that is that both at the global level and at the national level, we must expect both interest rates to continue to rise and inflation to be an ongoing problem. This is not a problem that's going to get contained in a few weeks or a couple of months. In Tamil Nadu, as you know, we have done better than the national average by quite a bit, even by the National Statistical uh, Office release that uh, Inflation is much lower here, at about 5.4% compared to the national average of 7.8 or something. We also never had the recession in 2021, and uh, the bond stack in 2021-2022 has been at least as good. So on a net-net basis, our economy has continued to grow uh, significantly compared to the national average. In some ways, that also alleviates the inflation pressure because, you know, we did a lot of demand stimulus when the economy was weak. And therefore, there's not that kind of big bounce back in demand at this point. But what it tells us, I think, is that we have to be very diligent about our work because we are going into some very difficult times. The headwinds are only going to get stronger. Uh, the need for coordination between us is only going to increase. And, uh, you know, the union... Uh, Secretary here, Deputy Secretary here, highlighted some of the programs and some of the uh, schemes that the government is doing, the Indian government is doing. I welcome those. I hope they are implemented successfully. Our Finance Secretary, who is very detail-oriented and a very diligent person, has explained all the different schemes, the rate of uptake, the places where significant attention is needed. I urge you to uh, take his comments very seriously and pick those areas where he has pointed out significant underperformance and see whether we can improve that. Uh, I take Mr. Swami's point about scheduling these meetings uh, in a way that facilitates RBI's greater involvement, uh, though the original schedule is upset by 
or COVID. Uh, you may remember it was scheduled and called off because of third wave conditions. So we'll find a way to reset it by the next quarter and uh, make it more convenient for the RBI. Uh, I also note Nabad's significant role in uh, especially the underserved and the you know, underbanked areas of the economy. Uh, they play a vital role. I'm grateful for all their intervention. I urge them to continue to ramp up. As I mentioned in the last SLBC meeting, there was a bit of a slowdown. I urge them to correct it, and I hope they'll take those comments to heart. From our perspective as a government, we are interested in a very keen uh, and active and productive relationship between the government, the Reserve Bank, Nabad, and the commercial banks would be they nationalized or uh, private. We think that such coordination, fiscal policy, monetary policy, execution of schemes, combined focus, um, matching of delivery to intent, and frequent monitoring with accurate data on a timely basis is a competitive advantage. We believe very few states do that in fact, many countries don't do that. And so we are very keen as a government on behalf of the Chief Minister, I will say that it is our ambition that we must have the most productive, most impactful, uh, best functioning SLBC in India. And I think we have the team to do that. And I hope we'll achieve that um, in outcomes rather than just in uh, discussions. So with that, um, let me apologize for being a few minutes late this morning. I, I just come back from overseas and there are some undue complications. But um, <coughs> let me thank you all once again for coming here today <coughs> and for attending diligently, particularly the many senior officers of the government. I know they are at least as busy as I am. Um, I just want to leave with one thought. You know, as we go through correcting the fisc and uh, playing our part in providing a healthy environment, not crowding out private players in the debt market, bringing confidence to investors in the state's management of its own finances, and therefore being able to support FDI with better incentives and lever up our capital investments. I just want to tell you the scale of the transformation we are expecting to achieve in the next couple of years and why it's crucial that even our government officers need to understand um, that we need to play at a different level than we have played in the past. Last year I think we did a record, if I'm not mistaken, level of capital investments and that is about 37,000 crores. If we had been in compliance with the FRBM and our own FRA, uh, really that number should have been closer to 60 or 65,000 crores, or maybe 70, 75,000 crores. So we basically did about half the investment we should have done. But as I said, we improved the fiscal situation significantly, and we are on a path where we have committed in two years that will be near compliance. In fact, I'll tell you, our ambition is to be well in compliance. For the projected number we have said is to be near compliance. And as somebody pointed out, our projected GSDP this year is almost 24 lakh crores. And the expected growth rate for the next two years after that in the NTFP is roughly the same, notional of 14%. Inflation is going to be a bit high. So let's say real growth of 7 8%, easily achievable. That means in a couple of years, let's say 24-25, we're going to be a 30 lakh crore or 3 trillion rupee economy. If we are in compliance with the FRBM and FRA, as I say, at that point, our capital expenditures will be on our own balance sheet somewhere around 90,000 crores, 3%, because we'll have zero revenue deficit. 90,000 crores, we believe that with the ecosystem that has been created, partly by our predecessors, partly by us, including things like the Tamil Nadu Infrastructure Fund Management Corporation and other investment vehicles and some changes we are doing to improve the viability and the credibility and attractiveness of these vehicles as sources of funding, we can do probably 1.5% of GSDP in off-balance sheet funding. So that's another 45,000 crores. 
If that is the case, we are going to end up quadrupling the annual capital investment between 21-22 and 24-25. I don't think in the history of any state government that has ever been done before. We hope that we'll get huge benefits in terms of trade, investment, growth, jobs, etc. out of that. But what it also tells you is that the infrastructure, the ecosystem, the approach, the execution capability needs to be significantly greater than it is now. There's no way that with the systems and people we have now, I mean like contractors and partners, that we can execute that state. We simply cannot. So we have to start planning for those kinds of sea changes. Uh, that means us in the cabinet, that means certainly our officers in the government, uh, but it also means the people uh, who facilitate into the system, all of you in the banking sector. So I'll just leave you with that thought. Thank you again for your time and uh, wish everybody a successful and productive meeting. Thank you.